Good evening, all of you. And let's go on a flight of uh, fantasy, not really fantasy, but exploration of life. No. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? So, um, welcome to you. yet another um, little talk with all of you. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you for joining, but I'm also excited that we're going to be talking about a very interesting aspect of life. Like Swarna said, everyone talks about attitude and some people, the younger people today, they use it in a negative sense. So they're always saying, don't throw attitude, don't give me that attitude. So, and you know, I had an American friend from Colorado, from the Rocky Mountains, and he used to say that in America we do, uh, we have a very simple way of aligning attitude. So we tell the guy, if he's not behaving, we tell him, look, I'll take you to the back of the uh, building and align your attitude for you. So uh, attitude is a word that is often used by everyone. And yet, I don't think people think about it often enough to know that it can change your life. Yes, that's what I said. And I'm going to use a lot of humor here. So those who don't like humor, try to get used to it because I think it's the best stress buster in life to handle your own attitude, uh, to handle your own ego. So why did I call this talk the ABCD of right attitude? I'll come to that later. Before that, I want to thank you for inviting me to the most beautiful emerald island in the world, Sri Lanka. Now what Sri Lanka is most famous for, well, you can talk about spices, you can talk about so many other things about Sri Lanka tea, of course salon tea, as we call it in India. Uh, but it's the beaches and it's the sea that is always, always remembered when you visit Sri Lanka. So I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to actually tell you that everyone has a great attitude on a good day. You don't even need to talk about it. You don't need someone to tell you how to deal with a good day. I think the challenge is when the day is not all that good. So uh, let's see what happens to us in reality. Um, as I told you, Sri Lanka reminds you of the blue seas and the green um, of the island, the Emerald Island as it's called because of the green. And then of course the blue seas all around. I just love the beach and the, you know, reminds me of the words of Rumi that I have uh, shared with you that it's easy to have a life where on a perfect day, you just open up the sails and flow. The, the boat just sails. You don't need to worry about it. What happens on the other days when life is not so easy? And that's when you realize the power of attitude. And you know, in Mantra, the company that I run, we came up with a model called the C, S-E-A. And that's why I wanted you to have a look at the C when I talk about it. So see, you know, and in mantras, uh, we, we love acronyms. Our company itself is called Mantra, M-N-T-R-A, which is a very sacred word, both in Sri Lanka and in India, and any part of the world today, uh, the dictionary recognizes the word mantra. So even mantra is an acronym. It's an acronym for management, training, research, associates. And then we came up with this model, which I'm going to share with you called C, S-E-A, right? And what is uh, S-E-A? Uh, the S stands for self-awareness. Who am I, right? What am I doing here? Unless I know that, I cannot be successful in life. So the first change in attitude is becoming aware of yourself. Today, it's a big study all over America, thanks to a gentleman called Daniel Goldman. Those who like a uh, little bit of, um, you know, the intellectual stuff. Uh, Daniel Goldman is a great uh, thinker in America who came up with a term called emotional intelligence. So uh, the first step of the framework, emotional intelligence framework, is what we call self-awareness. I have two definitions in Passing, very quickly, I'm going to give it to you and you can make a note if you like, but at least I remember it because it helps me and I hope it helps you. The first thing about self-awareness is know who you are. 
And what do I mean by that? In marketing, in management, we use a term called SWOT analysis. S-W-O-T. So here we change it to S-L-O-T. What is S-L-O-T? Well, S is for strengths. So take a sheet of paper, divide it into four. In the first column, write down your strengths as a human being. What are the things you're good at? What are the things you that make you feel proud of yourself? That make you feel competent, wanted, valued, esteemed, and most importantly, happy. So write that down in your first column. Those are your strengths. The second column normally in management is W or weakness. What is the weakness of the product? I'm going to call it limitation because human beings don't have weaknesses. They have limitation. If they put their mind to it, every limitation can be overcome and made into a strength. So I'm going to call it a limitation. So on the other column, on the other side of the page, write down your limitation and start working on them. But remember, the mantra is strengthen your strengths before you weaken your weaknesses because to survive, the best attitude is using your strengths all the time. So you need to look at your strengths first and work on them to survive. And then to succeed, you start working on your limitation. And of course, all your strengths, which you write in the first column, at the bottom in the third quadrant, they convert into opportunities. So look out for opportunities to use your strengths. Automatically, one and three, the two, two quadrants uh, match each other. Go to the limitations. If you don't work on them, what happens? You go to the fourth quadrant and we call it T or threat. So S-L-O-T, slot yourself. And why is it a threat? Because you haven't worked on your limitations. They grow on you and your attitude becomes so unbearable for yourself and others that they become a threat to your success, sometimes even for your survival. COVID is a great example. So self-awareness is in a very simple definition. Know your slot, where you slot yourself in life. What are your strengths? What are your limitations? How can you create opportunities and how can you avoid threats? But to make it even more simple, the first change in attitude you need to make is align your mind with your body. Keep your mind where your hands are. That's the first change you need to make. Most of the time, as you're listening to me, your mind is somewhere out there saying, hey, this guy reminds me. You know, his bald head reminds me of so-and-so. His voice reminds me of so-and-so. And you know, when you say, oh, that's a great color. That's my favorite pink uh, dress. And your mind shifts and jumps. So you have to avoid that. The first sign of integration of body and mind, and I call it an MBA. What is an MBA? Mind, body, alignment. That's the first change in attitude that many of us can make. Our mind keeps jumping like a monkey. I was so good at talking about this that one guy came to me and said, sir, I remember you spoke last year, I attended that. And ever since, I've never forgotten you. I said, oh, wow, I feel nice. He said, sir, you spoke, your topic was, the mind is a monkey. I said, really? Yes, I remember that. He said, and you know, after that, ever since, whenever I see a monkey, I think of you. Obviously not a nice thing to uh, listen to, but I understood what he meant, that the mind is a monkey. And unless you remember this, you will not understand why our attitudes keep shifting all day, like the mind. So self-awareness is about knowing. And it is about being aware that your mind is. And you know, you could actually cheat yourself if you're not aware. And I'll give you a good example. It's an old movie, Dean Martin, the famous Hollywood hero, right? All of us love his looks. Just watch this clip and you will understand what I mean. How you fool yourself in life with the wrong attitude because of lack of self-awareness. Yep. Well, no, don't worry, just like I promised you, I'm only having one drink. <laughs> See how you fooled yourself? <laughs> you say, you know, I'm not going to eat, you know, I think I'm done, and then, no, just one more, it's okay. And somebody says, you know, this is your last cigarette, you're going to die, then it's over. I better be, I better watch out. So why would you allow somebody to push 
from a limitation to a threat before you wake up? Why would you allow a marriage to get to the point of a break when you want to work back on it? Why would that happen? Because of lack of self-awareness. However, the S, let's go back to the C. Yeah, I don't mean the beach, S-E-A, right? So self-awareness, two simple things. Know yourself better. Spend more time on yourself rather than wondering about others. In fact, there's a joke in New York that when two psychiatrists meet, you know how they greet each other? They say, hi, you are fine. How am I? Because everyone knows how others should be and they keep looking at others. Nobody looks at themselves enough. So first sign of self-awareness, spend more time on yourself. Try to bring your mind where your hands are. Don't allow it to run all the time into the past or the future. So that's self-awareness. But more importantly, in the C, we have the E in SEA. And that is energy or enthusiasm. This is the thing we are all born with, but we don't use it enough. The first attitude changes, lift your energy. When it comes to doing something, we call it enthusiasm. But when it comes to relating with people, we call it empathy. Two important things to do. If it's task, your enthusiasm. But if it's people, your empathy. And remember, you need a lot of energy to empathize with people. It's not easy. Everyone has their own standpoint. Nobody likes to give in. And you have to learn to understand that he and he or she also has a right to a view. And you have to use that energy to try and influence them. This is what good managers do. This is what good human beings do. This is what good leaders do. But most importantly, this is what every professional does. You move it till the other person understands or relates with you. So, you know, empathy is great. Again, you can fool yourself like Dean Martin did with the glass of wine, which you remember, right? I'll talk about another interesting guy and in how he, you know, looks at life. And I, I think you will love the humor in this. Uh, but it also sets you thinking, what do we do about empathy? How do we relate with others? How do we understand problems? the right way, not the way our friend in this video is. So let's have a look at him. My mom always said that you have to eat everything from your plate. You have to eat all the food because there is starvation in Africa. And then I ate uh, every day. And then I grew a bit older and I started to think that how have I helped <laughs> the situation in uh, in, in Africa. Uh, I'm now a little bit overweight. I hope they are happy. I, I have done my best. Eating so much. If I ever go to Africa and, and they look at my belly, I will say that I did it for you. I hope you enjoyed that. How often we fool ourselves that we are doing things for others when actually we do it for ourselves. And we actually don't even understand the problem. So empathy is really the care that you need for other people to be in their shoes. That's what the definition of empathy is. Be in the other person's shoes. And you know, some uh, great thinker put it very beautifully. He said, how can you be in somebody else's shoes without taking out your own shoes. That's important. You have to learn to withdraw from yourself and detach yourself enough to understand the other person. So I call that the perfect example of detached attachment in relationships, uh, the best between spouses. And I hope I save many marriages in this one hour today with all of you. Try to understand the other person from a detached position from your own. Otherwise, it can't work out. It's easy to be very selfish about it. But once you start respecting the other person's right to selfishness, you start really having empathy. So that was E. So S, self-awareness. E, enthusiasm to do things. And empathy for relationship. Most importantly, A, assertiveness. So what is assertiveness? To me, assertiveness is very simple. Dealing with your feelings. All of us have feelings as human beings, right? Can we deal with it better? And what is the way to deal with your feelings? 
respect your own feeling, but also respect the other's feeling. If you do that, it's an assertive relationship. Again, I'm going back to uh, bosses and subordinates. I'm talking about managers. I'm talking about siblings. I'm talking about even heads of countries talking to each other. Assertiveness is about creating a win-win where you respect each other's feeling and you decide sometimes to agree to disagree so that you can't work on a relationship, but you still respect the other person's right to it. And of course, you pay for it if you cross those lines. So there are people who say, look, I did it, I deserve it. Right? If you have that attitude, that's perfect. I tell lies, I deserve this. That's a great attitude. Then you can accept other people's lies as well. But if I am like, no, 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 nobody can tell lies to me. That's not fair. Then I think, and you know, now little children, even my grandson at home keeps, he's learned that art of dealing with his mother better. And he says, that's not fair, right? Now he's only seven. He doesn't know what is fair, but he knows when to say it. That's attitude. Now you have to, and that's how my daughter deals with it. She sorts it out by communicating better with him. To know that, you know, we can create a win-win by communication. There's a very interesting book called Hostage at the Table. And this is about a super sleuth, a super policeman. Uh, or rather, he's a negotiator. That's about it in America. But he's wanted by all the greatest, uh, the biggest governments in the world to deal with the greatest terrorists to bring them to the table and negotiate. Assertiveness is a skill. Because if you don't have the emotional intelligence, again, you get attached to your view against the other person's view. Create a problem and poof, you get into trouble again. So assertiveness is about creating a beautiful win-win relationship. And again, let's go back to a quick video that might sort the problem out in terms of what is assertiveness. Let me leave you thinking. Yeah. Every time you say yes, you're saying no to something. So every time you say yes to a 30 or 40 or 60% important activity, you're saying no to something in the top 90%. And, and that's, I think, the big shift of, of mindset that's necessary. Because otherwise, people just look at something and say, well, is it good? Yes. Uh, as if, as if life is a is a closet universally large so yeah. you can fit in any number of items of clothing and it will never fill up yeah but as we all know from our actual closets if you just keep on saying yes to good stuff soon it's packed too full there's no there's no room for anything new you can't find anything that you actually want and so you have this very unsatisfying overloaded experience and i think that you know, that's the metaphor for life is, is that, that we, our lives are very full of stuff, but they're not satisfying because the most important things either aren't in there or we can't find them, we can't enjoy them. And, and so essentialism, I think, is a really achievable life bit by bit, just like uh, getting your closet organized is doable, but you have to learn some new habits and new adjustments. Sorry, Dan. Yeah, I hope the point is well made. You want a good life, you have to work hard at it. There's no easy way to success. You've got to work hard on your attitude. So, you know, I've, I've given you a fair idea of what is the C model. Be more self-aware. I hope you buy that. Be more enthusiastic about doing things and about empathetic uh, relationships. And most importantly, remember that life is like the sea. Uh, you know, of uncertainty in mystic mystery, which means that you can't understand it all, but you have to live it. You can't wait till you understand all of life and you live it. Uh, somebody put it very beautifully the other day. He said, you know, I learned all about life in three simple words. It goes on. That's all you understand about life. It goes on. Whether you're there or not, life goes on. So you have to adjust your attitude all the time to change. It's like your blood pressure. It's like your pulse. We don't actually feel it all the time and say, no, 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 it's gone up. I don't know why it's gone up. No, all through the day, you're hoping that everything is fine, but there is dynamic change within your system. 
even in the body. Forget about the attitude, which is a mental uh, dynamic. You have to really learn to adjust all the time. I was in the newspapers a couple of days back um, because it was about the IPL. I know in Sri Lanka, you watch the IPL because the reigning champions, Mumbai, have a coach, one of the legends of Sri Lankan cricket, Mahila Jayawardena. And, and I think one of the other teams has a very young, uh, bright, fast bowler called Udana, uh, Isuru Udana, who also bowled uh, recently. Now, I was in the papers because we talked about somebody who was struggling uh, in spite of what the coach and the management wanted him to do, just couldn't work and perform on the field. The coach and the management knew it, but they stuck with it. And suddenly things changed around. And the guy got going. And while millions of people all around the world were fretting that he should not be playing, he should have been kicked out. It's easy to sit, you know, like an armchair critic and decide who should do what. But it's only the person who's wearing the shoes, who knows where it pinches. And this guy, we have to believe that everyone is trying their best. And this guy was trying his best. And even the great captains of Indian uh, cricket, like MS Dhoni, even the other day in the IPL said, I should believe everyone is trying their best. But if it's not happening, there must be a reason. And to accept that is the right attitude, not to be questioning that attitude just because you can't figure it out. That's why I call it mystic mystery. I think that's a very smart way of putting it because I made it up myself. But jokes apart, let's go on to a COVID situation. How does one understand attitude in COVID? What is an open mindset in COVID? Take a very simple example that I've shown you, right? The gray is literally what people think in gray, right? The shades of gray, not the 50 shades. I know where you're going, naughty minds. I'm talking of the gray on the left side, which talks about how people feel closed down in COVID. And if you read the other side, you will realize that every one of those things that you read can be seen differently with a different attitude. In the Indian Vedic tradition, which we call the Vedas, they say, Yadha drishti, tatha srishti. The way you look at the world, your world changes. The way you look at it, the world changes. Which means, Yatha drishti, the way you look at the world, tatha srishti, that's your world. So look at the way COVID has impacted everybody. If you look on the other side, the bright yellow side, it tells you this is the way you can start believing. It doesn't mean life will change. But if you change your beliefs, you can change your life. And I'll tell you why, by showing you a simple example as we go along, right? And I'll tell you why we called it ABCD. I mean, you're still wondering why I haven't come up with the topic for today. Up next, you will see uh, exactly why, right? Uh, first, let's have a look at the I mean, lots of jobs have been affected by the pandemic, but nobody's really talking about ours. We're burglars, obviously. Right. And uh, it's been tough because everyone is home right now. Yeah, we've been getting caught a lot lately. Nobody's going to work during the day. Nobody's going out at night. We even tried going outside of the city to rob vacation homes, and that was a bust. I mean, to tell you the truth, it's honestly getting kind of embarrassing. Before COVID, business was booming, but when you don't go to work, we can't go to work. Your home is our office. Has it been hard? Yeah, yeah. it's been it's been hard. I mean, Definitely. it's affected the whole burglar community. And I've been doing this for 40 years. Now I'm taking classes at community college. We've gotten so desperate, we've had to start getting creative. We've started porch pirating. Which isn't ideal, because you just never know what you're getting. I mean, what are we going to do with a vacuum hose and a book on chinchillas? But the Etsy ones are the weirdest. Uh, so it's, it's been tough, but you know, on the upside, we have been using this time to sharpen our skills. Right, yeah, we've also been boosting our tolerance against self-defense devices, tasers, pepper spray. Do we feel bad about being burglars? 
Not really. I mean, we only rob the wealthy. Yeah, we're like Robin Hood, you know? We steal from the rich and give to the poor, and we're the poor. Yeah, plus, you know, we're vital to the economy. Home security is a multi-billion dollar industry. Right, without us, you wouldn't have them. So, to those who say we're criminals, we say we're job creators. Yeah, we just gotta get through this rough patch. Yeah. So, is everything in your house stolen? Oh, we don't live here. Sorry, Hi. we thought you were Lovely out home. of town. You can try that. <laughs> Isn't that a light-hearted way of looking at a very serious problem across the world? Just look at the attitude, right? They're able to actually make a film creatively to tell you how robbers must be thinking and how robbers 2020 must be as a generation. But just look at the positives. At the end, they're able to laugh at it and say, look, we are actually supporting a multi-million dollar industry called uh, security. But for us, they wouldn't need security. And of course, they would all lose their jobs. And the best part is that we want to be called job creators, right? I mean, that is really something. It takes a lot of guts to look at what you do differently. And that is the first challenge I want to throw at you today. Can you look at what you're doing differently? That is attitude. In fact, the ABCD of right attitude only. Now I'm coming to uh, why I call the stock the ABCD of right attitude. Right? When we, we start our lessons in, as kids, we learn uh, the first things we learn in English, ABCD. Right? Not many of us realize that the very first letter, A, is something beyond just our thoughts. It's not even our mind. It's what triggers the mind. Right? It's not even our mind. People say, oh, so you are what do you think. In fact, that's what we use the word attitude as. Don't show me attitude. This is negative attitude. No. Attitude is not the thought of a person. It's what triggers a thought in the person. A tendency, if you want to call it that. So attitude, the right attitude in the right place. And I'll give you a simple example, which all of you can relate with. Uh, two children born to a drunkard, let's assume. An alcoholic uh, professional alcoholic, if you want to call it that. And uh, one son, from his little uh, childhood days, he wants to become like his father. He's a zero. So he starts practicing, pouring uh, you know, water, soda into a glass because he knows he's not allowed to. But as soon as he grows, he becomes you know, sort of even better than his father, sort of even aping his father. The other son who sees the struggles of the family and the way the mother has been struggling will not even touch it all his life. Have you seen these cases? I'm sure you have. Or even if you haven't, I'm sure you can relate with what I'm saying. Attitude is that difference that two siblings born in the same family have totally different orientations. Forget about others. I mean, why people are different. What about siblings? What about people born to each other? What about you know, what we call bromance, brothers born to different mothers, right? We use all of that, but what does that mean? It means similarity or alignment in attitude. So that's a very, very big challenge for us. We don't understand it, but I'll try to tell you what it is later. But before that, let me tell you why attitude is important, because attitude defines behavior. Behavior defines, in the long run, your character. And character defines, in the long run, your destiny. How many of you know of families living in total ruin, created by one person's stubbornness, cussedness, foolhardiness, adamance, call it what you want, but the family is tethering on the brink. One of the kids says, this is not on. I mean, I can't see this happening to us. And he challenges it, or she challenges it, and creates her own life. And the whole script changes. Have you seen that? The whole family comes back in that generation or maybe in the next generation. Nobody says thank you to anybody, but the fact remains that the attitude made the difference. The behavior made the difference. The character made the difference. And therefore, the destiny completely changed based on the character, which was based on the behavior, which is based on the attitude. So you can see what a beautiful chain it is, the A, B, C, D. But you, could, you don't know your own destiny, but you can control your attitude by 
focusing on the right thoughts that come up in your brain. Now, you don't know why you get so many thoughts a day, but you have a choice, picking the right thought, making it a feeling, picking the right feeling, making it, making it an action, picking the right action and making it a habit. Now, that is the difference. In that video that you saw, it was about creating the right habits. 90% of the time, we buy easily and store so much in our mind, there's no place to dump it. And we miss out on the best things in life. And that's why assertiveness was about saying yes to the right thing, saying no to the wrong thing. That's attitude. So what are these attitudes? And I'm going to just quickly run through it. We don't have all day. I'm very grateful that you have even a few minutes for me. Let me make the best use. So what are these four or six things that we can club under attitude? They're not actually six. They're actually only four. But you could actually fit one or two of them into the others. They telescope into each other. So the first thing is self-belief. Believe in yourself. Whatever you've done, you've made the choice. Don't blame your spouse. You took the choice. Don't blame your kids. You made those choices. Don't blame your parents. You made those choices. Almost all of us like to blame someone else. And they always say, fix the problem. Don't fix the blame. Work harder on the problem. And one simple tip for that to changing your self-believers. Be critical about others. That's what we do. But now I'm saying be critical about yourself. Be compassionate to yourself. That's what we do. We always find excuses for ourselves. Now, be compassionate about others. Be nice to them about the mistakes they make. But be hard on yourself when you make mistakes. And that's how a cricket match works out better. When people put pressure on themselves to perform, rather than expectations. And I, why am I telling you this? Because you're seeing it all the time. In the olden days, people hated each other when they made mistakes on the field because they felt their own security in the team depended on the other person's holding the catch or dropping. It. But today, the professional cricketers, they don't even show, they mask their face to show their disappointment to their colleagues because they know that guy is trying his best as well. So if he drops a catch, you just accept it and move on to the next ball. Pete Sampras, a great, great tennis player, never challenged an umpire uh, in a tennis match. He always went back to focus on the next point and to take back the advantage from the umpire who made a mistake. He says, look, I'll grab my game back. I don't need to worry about you. That's example of attitude. So beliefs are important. Self-belief is most important. Motives. Why do we do? I mean, you saw the example of uh, the guy from uh, who talked about eating for the people in Africa. Right? What is the motive? Right? The children want to, had to be fed and the mother said whatever they like to feed them. But if you believe that all your life, you're cheating yourself. Every time you do something, be honest about your motives. Tell people, look, I need your help because I need the business. And you will get better business than trying to mask it because you have a hidden agenda, ulterior motive. So be careful about ulterior motive. Be more transparent and open. That's motives. Standards. Set higher standards for yourself than you set for others. It comes easily for us to set high standards for others, what they should do. Rarely we talk about ourselves. And we lower it for ourselves conveniently. If you want to really succeed, change your habit by start by starting to set higher standards from yourself. What do you expect from yourself? And lower your expectations from others, you'll be more peaceful. I'm telling you, it's not a favor you're doing them, it's a favor you're doing yourself. You'll sleep better. Forgive them, you'll sleep better. Forget it, you will sleep better. What are the judgments you make, right? How opinionated are you to make judgments without, I mean, almost, a million people tell you how somebody should bat in a cricket match or how a prime minister should deal with a, uh, another country. It's very difficult to put yourself in those shoes. So every time you deal with others, suspend your judgment enough to understand before you judge. They always say it's easy to judge, very difficult to understand. Mindsets. Now those two are really not um, separate from the others, but I want you to think about them separately. Mindsets are important. You have to prepare yourself before you do something. Adjust your mind to it. So if you go into a meeting thinking, I'm going to have a problem with this guy, poof, you will have a problem too. 
If you go into a meeting saying, I'm going to create a win-win, I'm not going to shout, I'm going to hold my horses, I'm going to ride down, find desperate different ways and options to handle before something happens. That's how you create a mindset. And of course, the last is your values. Test your own values before you accept them. So if your really value is about eating, I, I've met lots of people who eat a lot and say, you know, but uh, you know, I'm very careful about what I eat, but they're not really being honest. If they have a value, it will show. I used to be a bulky guy myself. And then one day I felt I have to work on it and I started walking. Then I never felt like measuring because that's feeding yourself. You don't want to measure. Today I walked 10,000 steps and today what my friend Prasanna said today when, when we got on the show and he handles our uh, uh, Sri Lankan business for us and you know what he said? He said, you're looking great, you're looking young. Why did he say that? Because I work harder on myself simply because I was not being honest in my attitude till now. But I can regret it. Why should I? Why should I think back and say I've wasted so many years of my life? Today is the first day of the rest of my life. So this is the way. I, I thought I should leave some handy tips because that's also on the poster, remember? You're going to uh, call me up and say, you never gave me any handy tips. So I'm going to give you just five and quickly, if you can make a note of it. One, stop the four C's that control our attitude. Complaining is the top killer of our gratitude. In fact, one simple line to remember if you're making a note, complaining is the first sign of ungratefulness. When you're ungrateful for something, you start complaining. You go to a restaurant, they don't give you the best food. You made a choice, you went in. You have a choice not to eat. But to sit there, eat it all and complain, who gave you that choice? So complaining is, a, is something you need to work about. Uh, comparing. Children, the biggest killer for potential in a family is comparison. Oh, your brother is so much better. You know, you don't know, you can't do this. And you know, so just look at him. Just look at that guy next door. Look at this girl next door, how she's uh, studying. Puts down the person. All you need to say is, I know she is very good at it. I know you're good at this, right? I know that you're not good at Max as she is, but she's not good at uh, poetry like you are. And unless you stop comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges and certainly comparing apples with oranges, which is the biggest mistake people make, right? Comparing doesn't take you anywhere. Try to be fair in your, I don't say stop these seeds, I'm saying be aware of these four seeds. In fact, I should change that slide. Instead of saying stop four seeds, I must say, be aware of these four seeds, right? And the four seeds are complaining, comparing, condemning, without knowing what you're condemning. You condemn very easily. And conspiring, that's the biggest killer in relationship. You know, so many of us conspire in the family. You tell your son about your, your husband or your wife, saying, you know how she is, this is how she did. And you are actually destroying two lives, right? Conspiring in the family is the biggest crime you can think of. Conspiring as friends. You know, let's not tell him we are going for this movie. You know, if he comes there, he'll get drunk and he will make a scene. So let's avoid him. It's much nicer to give him feedback that, you know, if you're doing this, I'm not taking you to the party. It's much nicer to confront. So how do I deal with these forces? Confrontation. Confrontation doesn't mean fight. It means creating a win-win where you put people in touch with reality. I mean, I can go on and on, but don't get too carried away. What's the second one? Whatever happens in your life, attitude is so what? I don't have to give you examples. All around us, there are cases of people defying the odds, coming back stronger, all because they ask this question, so what? Okay, so we are five down and you know, we have 100 runs to make and we have only 10, 10 overs to make it. So what? We're going for it. I mean, always look at the positive side, which is whatever has happened, you can't undo. But what can we learn from it and move on? So, so what is a great question. But it can be, it depends on the tone. If you're reacting to somebody, if somebody says, you know, and the other day it happened to me, I was driving and, you know, I tried to cross the signal. I, I was thinking of something else and I didn't see the red light. 
And I saw it, but I just didn't stop. I crossed the light and there stands a policeman. He stops me and he comes up to me and you know, I'm looking like a good professor and he, I bring down the glass and he says, sir, and he gave me so much respect. He said, sir, didn't you see the red light? I had to be honest and I said, yes, I did. He thought I was being defiant. And he said, then why did you stop? I said, uh, I smiled and I said, because I didn't see you. He smiled and he said, sir, educated people like you should not do this. So anyway, carry on, but be careful about the lights. And both of us had a win-win. This didn't happen, I just made it up. So don't look at me like that. The point is, the point is that you can certainly renegotiate anything with a so what with the right tone. But if you use the wrong tone, you start a fight. So what? If I had asked the policeman, so what? Okay, I didn't stop, so what? I'm stayed away inviting trouble in the form of the lockup. Lockdowns are good, lockups are very not so desirable. So ask so what? Well, in the MBA, I already mentioned this in passing, I'm not going to repeat it, but always managed by anticipation. And how do you manage by anticipation? Mind-body alignment. Your mind should be with the body before you do something. So you know and you're always integrated. This is what Buddhism is all about, incidentally. This is what all the great religions are all about. It's about aligning your mind and body. If you do that, all over the world, people know that you are integrated. Teach, uh, teach, teach not on. Okay, the famous Vietnamese a uh, monk, Buddhist monk, uh, lived in uh, America, lives in America, I think. And one lady was in the building, was coming home and she'd just been diagnosed with cancer. She was so upset. And she rushed into his uh, apartment in the ground floor and said, I have to tell you this, why me? I mean, I'm dying. And you know, he just smiled and he said, so am I, we are all dying. And it might look like a shock to the other person, but it calmed her down because she was just being agitated about something she couldn't control. Of course, the next uh, attitude is what next? Something happened and you say, what next? And you move on from a failure by saying, what next? And the last is look ahead and act on your thoughts and feelings. So people like to plan, but they don't work on them. So if you want a habit, start working on small plans for the next one hour. Next one hour, what am I going to do? Next two hours, what am I going to do? Start setting small targets. I'm going to have a bath. I'm going to call this person. I'm set up small hourly plans and you'll find more energy to get on with the days and the years. So, um, yeah. So basically what is attitude? I'll put it all in just one sentence, right? Forget about the past. Learn from it, but don't live in it. People have regrets. They have guilt. They keep talking about it. Say, why did this happen to me? Remember, nothing helps when it happens. When it is over, you learn something. It's like a sugar cane. Get the juice out of it. That is the essence, the learning. Throw the cane out. What are you doing with a crushed cane? That's your challenge. Number two, act in the present, but don't react. For God's sake, don't react to me. I'm saying so many things. Don't say, no, he's talking. Uh, who understands? Nah, nah, nah. The moment you do that, you are robbing yourself, not me. I will talk and I will go away. You will have to live with it. So what's the change in attitude? Less reaction, more action. What does that mean? Think and act is acting. Act and think is reaction. Most of us say something and then think about it. And then the guilt sets in. I should have been careful. I shouldn't have talked like that. This is not the way to, I don't know why I do this. All these are reactions to a situation. Whereas acting is, did I say that? Okay, then it must be right. I'm sorry I said it. Right. So the first step you can take in that is, I'll, I'll make it, I, it should have been a slide, it is not. S-T-E-P, make a note. Say sorry when required. Say thank you when required. Say excuse me when required and say please when required. These help your relationships. So start planning for the future but don't worry about the future. Another killer, all the three things that I have mentioned can be positive and negative. Planning is positive, but living in the past 
or learning is positive but living in the past is negative acting is positive but the reacting is negative and planning is positive but worrying very very negative how often we find that we are worrying all the time and there's no better way than to put it in one sentence for you and that's what i've done i've said learn from the past act in the present plan for the future let it become a continuous habit so every time i drive the car i learn from the last time oh when i reach that corner there's a bump there i should be careful now one day the bump will be removed if i'm self aware i will become aware that from today the bump is not there right and sometimes google tells you these things but sometimes google doesn't know that the road repair is not happened right and that's why i take the blame on yourself and that's why i've come to the most important aspect of course my mentor in life swami chinmayananda who lived in india worked all over the world built and and you know my connection as swarna mentioned with sri lanka with the cord organization the founder was a very dynamic monk for you know the greatest possibly one of the greatest in the century and what he said was interesting he said caesar would not be wolf if romans were not sheep right and it is we who give might and power objects to persecute us with their joys and sort even joys remember shouldn't persecute you you shouldn't be so much in love that you start suffering from it right love is great as long as you can enjoy it if you are in a love relationship where you're suffering it's not love after all it's lust people want it but they don't know how to relate with it so i think it's important to remember joys and sorrows are great as long as you control them and they don't control you and otherwise you're living in persecution and prosecution so that's something to remember i'm going to play a little video at this point and okay we'll do a small case study and then we'll come to the video yeah so this is a, again a covid related story looking at the picture you realize it's a very innovative way of running a restaurant imagine a restaurant with different level it's not happened uh, anywhere but this is a little uh, restaurant in malaysia in kuala lumpur where somebody thought that this is a innovative way of dealing with covid because people can't sit with each other they are afraid of each other how to um, manage social distancing so yeah you can actually read the story in the next slide yeah uh, you let to adjust the slide uh, yeah yeah so uh, as you can see uh, you know this is a cafe in malaysia and all they did was spent extra money to reinvest in their business in their interiors saying that if that makes people happy we are fine it's a win win never mind if we take longer to make back our money but we are doing it for our customers and they are happy now this is an example of dealing with a bad scene in the economy and i know my colleagues here in india who are doing a great job without with a smile on their face they are rebuilding their business you have a huge hotel full of empty rooms but you also learn that people are buying take away food so you start making food and sending it out and you don't you you have to be ethical and that's where the standards are so this was just one case study that i wanted to share with you um so i think in the end we'll go back to the sea where we started right sri lanka is so full of those beaches and those those little uh, sail boats right and um, you know i remember the blue waters um of colombo on the beach and then you know i i can't help remembering how linked it is to attitude next time you look at that scene remember that you can't change the ocean or the weather no matter how hard you try it's best to learn how to sail in all conditions they always say uh, a boat or a ship is always safe in the harbor but remember that's not what they were built for so get out of your comfort zone try to push yourself till you get what you want and i i want to give you an example of finding out the right attitude uh, from the founder of toyota right the toyota car company uh, he's going to share a, a little bit of wisdom i'm going to uh, make you listen to it and think about it yourself
find what makes you happy and don't let go. You should know I didn't come here to tell you the usual stories about the mountains you may have to climb or the challenge you have to meet. No, because I think we should just go ahead and assume everything is going to work out great. I think all of you are going to be a big success. I really do. And that's where I get tricky, because you are going to be successful. You are going to climb the ladder and make the money. But we will be doing something that is fun, something that you really love. Because when you are as talented as I know all of you are, it is so easy to wake up one day and find yourself in golden handcuffs with a mortgage and three kids. So whether you are entering a family business or not, now's the time to figure out what speaks to your heart the most. Beginning of your career is really the best part because you have the freedom to try different things before the inevitable responsibilities of life pile up. So use this time, this freedom, that your youth provides to find your happy world. And don't be afraid if it's not what's expected. I'm lucky in some respect because I knew what I wanted to do at a very early age. When I was a little boy, I knew for sure that I wanted to be a taxi driver. <laughs> it didn't completely work out. But it's pretty close. <laughs> I get to drive cars and be around cars all the time. And if there's one thing I love more than donuts, it's cars. <laughs> Toyota has been building cars for over 80 years now. But, but we actually work. started out in the weaving loom businesses. My great-grandfather invented the automatic weaving loom, but it was my grandfather, Kichiro, who took us from making fabric to making cars and created the company we have today. I'm actually the third generation Toyota to run our company, and perhaps you have heard the saying, the third generation knows no hardship or ruins everything. <laughs> well, hopefully that will not be the case. I mean, I did graduate from Babson after all, <laughs> as that would have been though, as soon as I became CEO, we, we had the Great Recession. Yeah, so... I was just telling you that even the destiny of the Toyota car company changed. They were making looms till somebody decided that when the world has changed, we have to change with it. And cars were just coming in. And in 1927, you can see how Toyota changed. Uh, and actually, Toyota, not Toyota, but Toyota. And from that name, the most famous car company in the world. So this is how destiny changes because of attitude. And you can see how his attitude is so strong and positive. Uh, you should see the rest of the video on YouTube. If you type in uh, Babson College, I'm sure that would be the only one. Toyota and Babson College, you'll probably get the video. Uh, so what I'm trying to tell you is attitude is the same whether you're born rich like a Toyota or like the man on the street, it's all the same. Time is the same for everybody, 24 hours. Attitude is the same, neutral to all. It's up to you to make something out of it. And remember, <clears throat> I want to end by just reminding you that your desire for success is the only change that, uh, that matters. Uh, that, that's the most important thing, that you must decide that your desire to be successful is more important than your fear of failure.
Many of us are afraid of failing and that's why we uh, develop a negative attitude. So how do you become successful? Start desiring it in everything you do. And I'm sure you will make a very, very big difference. So challenge your beliefs first. What are, what are your basic beliefs? And that's why I always say at Mantra, we always say yes. And that's the last slide. Right, and I want to end on this with a little video clip to tell you what I meant. Always remember that we don't try to change beliefs in people. We try to transform the believer. Now, I'll show you a little clip where a man thought that he had saved himself. And there's no bigger job in the world than a goalkeeper in a football match trying to save his goal. And just see what happens when you take things for granted. I think that's a nice note to end this talk on. I hope you're enjoying uh, the talk and let's see what uh, this video tells. But they've dodged every bullet since surrendering the two goals. And here they come. Hey, Johnson forward. Safe for Butler. It took a deflection off of Barrera and somehow it goes in. What a turn of events. There you are. He thinks he's a superhero because he scored the goal. But what he really did was to have his foot out at the right time, at the right place, to get the ball into the goal. So if you have the right attitude, you have to start having greater self-belief. And it's not about winning or losing. It's about a positive attitude in a negative situation. Never, never, never give up. That's the famous line that Winston Churchill who had actually never been to college, used when he went to Oxford for the convocation address. She used only seven words. Never, 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 ever give up. I think he used only seven words to say, never, ever give up. So that is the power of attitude. If you focused on what you want and you keep trying all the time, the world will change and you will be at the right time, the right place to achieve the right results. So I hope I made a difference to you. Uh, you've given me what you can never get back in your life, one hour of your life, right? You've not paid for this program, but you've actually paid much more than you ever know by giving me one hour of your life. I'm grateful to you all of you for that. I'm grateful to Swarna and Gauri for having faith in what we do at Mantra. I'm grateful to Prasanna for uh, pushing it beyond limits to people all over the world. And of course, to my own friends and colleagues who are attending. But I think the greatest change you can have is an attitude of gratitude. If you're alive, be grateful, live gratefully. And that is why we call it an attitude of gratitude. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Live it up. wants to come in. Swarna, Prasanna, I hope all of you are there. Yeah. If yes, they are, we are. Yeah. Sorry, Prasanna. Go, go ahead. ahead. It's open for the audience. You can unmute. You can uh, yeah. open your camera and talk to Gaur, uh, Keshav. And uh, it's up to you. Right. Okay. It's your time. <laughs> Take yeah. it up. Put, put your thoughts in the chat window. Reach out. I'll be happy to know if, if it was useful. Would like to say something. It's been great, Keshav. As usual, you know, there's a lot of uh, in-depth knowledge uh, that you actually give us. I have a question that has been sent, yeah. and um, the person who has sent it has said, "Don't take it personal." Yeah. When we listen to you or people like you, yeah. it says and it seems so easy in reality. But why is it so difficult to change one's attitude? It also says, have you ever managed your attitude properly? If yes, we would like to have an example. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. Uh, interesting question. I'm very happy that you uh, heard of it. Uh, so is it easy? The very question 
answers itself. The very fact that you're asking, is it easy? I mean, nobody asks, uh, is it easy to breathe? Because if we take it for granted and it's not in our control. If it was left to us, some of us might have forgotten to breathe. But luckily, God doesn't give us that option. He takes care of the number of breaths you have in your life. So is it possible? I think it is willpower that makes a difference. And willpower is very easy to uh, talk about, very difficult to practice. So willpower comes from daily uh, awareness. So I said it is about self-awareness. I used to smoke occasionally when I was in college. I used to enjoy a drink as well. But it was easy to give up when somebody challenged it. And as I mentioned, my life mentor, he challenged me and he said, you, you don't have to be a slave to this little white stick. Okay, you call it the cancer stick. You don't have to be a slave to it. Just because you want to show off to your friends that you're very much a part of the crowd, you don't have to. And he set me a target. He said, you can do it if you want by the next uh, birthday. He didn't say, give it up now. He said, it's not easy. It's going to come back at you uh, all the time. And it took me more than a year to phase it out of my life. But that's so long ago that I'm very happy now to share it with you. And it's possible if you have the willpower. Willpower comes from working on yourself, on, like you do with the body. I can't look at my muscles and keep saying, grow, grow, grow. That's not motivation. It's not going to grow. Right? It's not inspiration. It's actual pumping the iron, like they say. And then you work at it. Mentally, you can pump the iron. Mentally, like you clean your body, you have to clean your mind once in a while, and maybe daily, every day. So they say uh, meditation and prayer is like soap. You have to use it every day, like you bathe. You have to use it on your mind. Yep, I can go on and on, but let me just wait for something else. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, sir. Can I actually uh, say one or two things? Uh... First, I am Parthiban. I am a promoter of a pharmaceutical company from Chennai. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, I fully 100% agree with you. Attitude actually is the descender or ascender of our life. No doubt about it. But one more thing, I also know I read a lot of books. That's why I would like to convey this one. Yeah. There are two things that really matters in life, which are the DNA and luck. Yep. What I have found, you know, what I have read from the books and of course learned from actually people like you is, yeah. if you look at the life of Warren Buffet, he himself says, you know, ovarian lottery. When you look at uh, Bill Gates, he says, you know, ovarian intelligence. Yep. But people like me, you know, who hail from a rustic village, when I look back, although as you rightly said, you know, we love to actually learn from the past, Correct. but the subconscious toxin which is not that easy to eradicate, but of course, no, we'll have to psych ourselves up. Every day, you know, I'll have to do auto-suggestion, as you rightly said, that homework has to be very positive. The life comes in the form of actually chance and choice. Yes. You know very well, it's not my choice to born in the family which is poor. No. And as a baby and as an adolescent, yeah. self-esteem issues that one faces that makes a huge impact on your subconscious. Sure. Sure. Which I personally felt, I also, you know, I have traveled to some 56, 57 countries. I keep talking to people to find out whether I am on the right track. I, I test my thinking. I also test my beliefs. As you rightly said, once you transform, you should not doubt your belief. You should not believe your doubts. I fully agree with you. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful Thank experience. You know, listening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. And like you very rightly said, I use the word self-awareness for knowing what your things are, right? And therefore working on your things. So when you do that, you will understand circumstances also from that standpoint. That why were you placed in that circumstance? Why were you placed in that position in life? Why were you born in a poor family? And that could have happened because at some point you saw in life, in some past life, that I am good at fighting against odds. Maybe that's why you were placed in a position where you had to fight against the odds. Okay. Nobody wants to go in in a losing cricket match to go down 
to bat at that time. Nobody likes it. But they have to face that reality that the team is down and I have to go out to bat. In the army, nobody likes to go and fight somebody. But uh, they have to face it. And that courage is what makes the difference. It changes the circumstances. I fully agree with you. The courage and perseverance. When things doesn't happen the way you want, what is important, as you rightly said, actually, the grit, so the Thank grit, and way. when the lady luck doesn't smile on you, if you give up, then you are a loser. What is important is tenacity. And if you have the perseverance, you have a way to win. I fully agree with you. Thank you so tenacity, much. Tenacity, tenacity. Thank you tenacity. so much. Tenacity. Thank you very much. So if, if the R is up and if others are busy, then I would love to thank you all for having been here and of course to take it forward. Right? Whenever you feel that you can get in touch with us, with other topics that you might like, all of that will be fine. But uh, thank you once again. I would really love to thank Swarna and uh, Prasanna for reaching out to a whole lot of people and Gauri for supporting it with so much, uh, you know, so much open-mindedness, which is required today in the world. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice presentation once again. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck.